Hi, my name is Brian Helfand. I'm the D Division Chief of Urology at North Shore University. I'm a urologist who is specialized in prostate cancer, and I have a, a dual MD-PhD degree uh, where my focus in uh, my PhD was genetics, which has now uh, become very highly relevant and applicable uh, to personalized medicine, which has uh, been highlighted extensively uh, in the area of prostate cancer. And certainly, it's my uh, unique pleasure uh, to speak to everyone today regarding the use of genetic risk scores or polygenic risk scores um, in prostate cancer decision-making, but particularly uh, for prostate cancer screening. So within the past several years, uh, there has been increased recognition um, regarding the benefits of genetic testing uh, in the re realm of prostate cancer. Genetic testing, of course, and I'm not going to get into the details of it, usually involves a open conversation between the urologist, uh, even as a urologic surgeon, uh, but as uh, well as with the genetic counselors, and the details of how to actually implement this type of relationship will be different uh, depending on every institution, but certainly that open conversation um, and uh, relationship should happen uh, because there are many things that we are very good at as urologists um, in counseling and prostate cancer, but certainly we need the help of the genetic counselors as well. So this is a, a very collaborative relationship. But within the past uh, several years, genetic testing in prostate cancer has really become highlighted, and genetic uh, testing, uh, which uh, includes a thorough genetic assessment, is really relevant for many parts of prostate cancer decision-making, which range from the diagnosis to uh, prognosis for newly diagnosed prostate uh, cancer patients, uh, to as well as screening uh, both the uh, for prostate cancer and other related diseases in both the patient as well as their family members. Particularly uh, in terms of diagnosis, if patients are at risk of uh, developing uh, prostate cancer, particularly highly aggressive prostate cancer because of a specific mutation, we're gonna wanna know about it, so there's some utility there. In terms of prognosis, if a patient has a mutation that predisposes to aggressive prostate cancer, then perhaps management with active surveillance or other uh, more exploratory uh, or experimental uh, uh, procedures would not be recommended. And certainly, uh, the uh, has been increasingly recognized that if patients have certain mutations and they have advanced prostate cancer, they be, may be more susceptible to certain therapies, including PARP inhibitors or platinum-based therapy or even immunotherapies. Um, and so those uh, mutation status is very relevant in that population. And of course, many patients ask me, forget about them, what about their family members? And of course, genetic uh, testing for not only the patient, if they have a mutation, but for their family members, so that their family members can get uh, increased surveillance, not only for prostate cancer, but other related diseases uh, that they may be at risk for. So genetic assessment in prostate cancer has become uh, increasingly uh, important, uh, period. And uh, it's very important to recognize that it really takes uh, three components to do a thorough genetic assessment. I think uh, as a urologist and as many physicians, the most important thing that we're, we we're familiar with is family history. Uh, family history, when you look at all men with prostate cancer, really only explains between 7 to 10 percent of all men with prostate cancer. It's very important to recognize, but again, a relatively small proportion of men will actually report a positive family history. Rare pathogenic mutations. Uh, including those within the DNA damage repair pathway, such as BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, et cetera, are also important not only for pr uh, prostate cancer predisposition, but many of them are also important for the development of aggressive prostate cancer. Again, when we look at the overall frequency or relevance in all men with prostate cancer, it really only explains about 2 to 5% of all prostate cancer cases. The largest component of genetic assessment, which is uh, only becoming increasingly recognized, is really the single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP-based polygenic risk score. The most common of these polygenic risk scores is called a genetic risk score, 
But when you look at this, uh, this really explains between 20 to 30 percent of all men with prostate cancer. So largely can explain not only those who are at increased risk, but with that, and I'll explain later, you can also uh, identify those at decreased risk. But it is important to understand that a thorough genetic assessment really uh, involves family history, rare pathogenic mutation assessment, as well as a SNP-based polygenic risk score. To go through them quickly, uh, family history, again, is the most uh, widely understood uh, and most commonly used assessment of uh, inherited risk of prostate cancer. It's a very valuable tool for estimating that risk. However, it's important to understand that family history itself has many uh, limitations. Again, only a small, small proportion of patients will actually report a positive family history. And as such, uh, it may only be relevant to 7 to 10 percent of the entire uh, population that's at risk. And it can change throughout a man's lifetime. As an example, today my father doesn't have prostate cancer. Tomorrow uh, he's diagnosed, and all of a sudden my risk, while I've done nothing different, has increased uh, over time just because of his diagnosis. So it can change throughout your lifetime. Many patients don't know their family history. Again, it's not something that everyone discusses at the dinner table. And certainly adopted patients uh, don't even have a option to know their family history. And as such, uh, many of them are unfortunately somewhat discriminated in our, our clinical decision making just because of this lack of knowledge. If you have a negative family history, I don't have a family history of prostate cancer, it doesn't mean that that patient is not at risk of developing the disease. And as such, um, it, it, we should still screen these patients, but it's unclear of how to screen those patients. And uh, if you're going to capture family history, it is becoming increasingly recognized that it shouldn't just be prostate cancer, uh, but it should be of, of related cancers as well, including breast, ovarian, pancreatic, colorectal, endometrial, melanoma, et cetera. And when you look at the process flow of most clinics, we don't have a lot of time to really do a full family pedigree analysis, and so it, it really has not well been incorporated in. And for this um, reason, family history is important, um, but it it's really hasn't uh, been the ultimate uh, assessment of a, an individual's risk. The second part of genetic assessment are rare pathogenic mutations. Uh, within the past uh, five years, it has become increasingly recognized that mutations within uh, pathways, including the DNA damage repair or the mismatch repair mutations, can explain an increasing number of men with advanced prostate cancer, those are including metastatic and or lethal disease. In fact, uh, the largest study uh, showed that uh, between 8 to 12 percent of these um, patients will actually have pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutations within the DNA damage uh, repair. And because many of these do uh, or have been associated with aggressive or lethal disease, it would be important or relevant that if you're going to take a population of unaffected men um, but who are at risk of having one of these mutations, and because they do associate it uh, with a more aggressive prostate cancer, that you would want to screen these patients not only potentially earlier but potentially more frequently. And certainly many prospective studies, uh, such as the IMPACT trial, which is uh, an international trial of men with BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM mutations, has suggested that earlier screening or more frequent biopsies may be indicated in this population. And finally, uh, the subject of uh, the remainder of the talk will be the single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is the third, and I would argue, the most important uh, component of a genetic assessment for prostate cancer. For those of you who aren't familiar, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, are common genetic variations. I like to think of them as little blips throughout the DNA, and everyone has a certain number of blips or, or these SNPs um, for different diseases. Now, there's about 10 million SNPs in the human genome, and there are SNPs that are associated with prostate cancer. There are others associated with heart disease or colon cancer, et cetera. And we now know about these SNPs, and we know specifically that there are about 150 to 170 SNPs that are associated with prostate cancer risk. And the more of them you have, the increased risk that you have. And together, these SNPs will actually explain about 40% or more of the hereditary risk of prostate cancer. And together, you can actually count the number of these SNPs up and create what's called a polygenic risk score. 
One of the most common polygenetic risk scores that we use is called a genetic risk score, or a GRS. And a genetic risk score is just a number which is calculated based on the cumulative variation across multiple SNPs, which is then used to provide an estimate of the disease risk. And that's kind of a mouthful, but essentially what that means is that we can count up the number of SNPs that are associated with prostate cancer that any individual has, and then compare that to the average of the population. So if you uh, calculate that a genetic risk score value is equal to one, again, this is based on an average number of SNPs that a patient would have, that would indicate average risk of prostate cancer, and that would say that they would, in this country, have about a one in eight chance of being diagnosed with prostate cancer throughout their lifetime. If you had a value that was greater than one, that's increased risk, and a value less than one, it's lower risk. Specifically, if you had a genetic risk score value equal to two, that's two-fold higher than the average of the population, and that individual would have about a one in four chance of being diagnosed throughout their lifetime. If you had a score of 0 0.5, that's 50% lower, or about a one in 16 risk of being diagnosed throughout their lifetime. So in that way, every individual uh, can, uh, has a genetic risk score associated with prostate cancer, and you can precisely estimate what is their lifetime risk of developing the disease. One of the largest studies uh, of the genetic risk score which has been conducted uh, was out of the uh, United Kingdom. Um, and what they did was they uh, evaluated over 40,000 men with prostate cancer and compared to 40,000 controls, and they looked at their overall risk of prostate cancer using the genetic risk score. And again, as you can see here, the average of the population will have a value of one. As we increase uh, the, uh, your genetic risk score value, we can go up to almost a six-fold higher risk of being diagnosed throughout your lifetime of the disease. And at the other end, the bottom 1%, they have an 80% lower risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So again, the genetic risk score itself provides a, a spectrum, a precise uh, value of that individual's genetic risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer throughout their lifetime. Again, in that same study, if you compare it to what has been called our gold standard, which is family history, um, only, uh, first of all, uh, in this study, about 7% of the population had a positive family history, but all men with a positive family history, yes, of prostate cancer, only had about a 1.5-fold increased risk of being diagnosed with the disease. So you can see a direct comparison here of how genetic risk score is more informative because it does provide that range of risk to every individual. But uh, specifically, if you only use family history, which has been the gold standard to now, it's a one value that may or may not be relevant to that particular individual. Again, how can we use this in clinical studies and, and in real time? Uh, there have been many studies now that have supported uh, the use of the genetic risk score. This is a particular study um, that looked at the REDUCE trial. So these were men who were being monitored for prostate cancer. Um, over time and either exposed uh, to a placebo or uh, given a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And ultimately, if we use standard clinical vari variables in this model, and we only looked at the placebo arm, is that uh, using variables such as PSA or age or digital rectal exam status, we can uh, parse people into three different uh, categories. Again, this is what we all do. Do you have a low risk based on your family history or PSA? Do you have a, you know, kind of mid-risk, average risk, or higher risk? Um, but if you then apply genetic risk score within any uh, group, the genetic risk score actually provides independent information and gives you a more precise estimate so that if you have average risk, you can actually have, if you have an elevated genetic risk score, you have significantly higher, full, higher risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And even if clinically you have average risk, and you have a low genetic risk score, that significantly lowers your chance of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So the genetic risk score can stratify any clinical variable that we normally use, whether it's PSA, again, not shown here, but if we just use any PSA between two and a half to 10, uh, we will see that the genetic risk score at any value will parse uh, that risk out or stratify it out so that we can provide a more precise estimate of finding prostate cancer on a biopsy. Even newer biomarkers, including either the 4K score or the prostate health index, can also be further stratified if you apply the genetic risk score. So again, if you're going to use a genetic risk score for screening, which is probably the way it should be used, uh, it really helps um, 
the patient as well as the clinician identify that risk and help screen that patient more appropriately and or provide biopsies more appropriately based on their overall risk. So is there a prospective data uh, besides that clinical trial uh, that really supports a genetic assessment for prostate cancer and not only screening and, and outcomes? And the truth is yes. Um, one of the most recent studies uh, that we have published, um, or I should say submitted, is that uh, we've looked at the UK Biobank or the UKB. And this is a large prospective uh, cohort that includes over 250,000 men who have been followed for up to a 10-year period uh, in the U UK. Um, all men uh, have associated genetic assessment data, uh, meaning that they have family history information. They all have genotype information, and a large subset of them will actually have rare pathogenic mutation information. And so all these men uh, have outcome data in terms of their prostate cancer, whether they were diagnosed, um, and ultimately if they went on to die from that disease. And when we looked at it, um, we can see that uh, family history itself uh, was significantly associated uh, with prostate cancer incidence. So again, uh, that increased uh, the chance of a patient, if you reported a, a positive family history, about 1.7-fold of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Family history itself was not significantly associated with prostate cancer mortality. Um, certainly, rare pathogenic mutations, specifically those in BRCA2, HOXB13, and CHECK2, was associated with prostate cancer incidence. It likely are, at least a subset, BRCA2, ATM, and CHECK2, were associated with prostate cancer mortality. But since only about 1.4% of the population had a rare pathogenic mutation, it certainly wasn't powered sufficiently uh, to really comment on prostate cancer mortality. However, if you look at the uh, genetic risk score or polygenic risk score based on these SNPs, it really uh, not only was associated with prostate cancer-specific incidence, uh, but also prostate cancer mortality. So it was the only factor among those three genetic assessments that not only associated with uh, disease risk, but also mortality. And interesting, once again, is it is relevant because you can tell patients who are at increased risk of uh, developing prostate cancer or dying of prostate cancer at the high end. Um, but at the low end of everything, those patients are significantly at lower risk, not only of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, but also mortality. And certainly when you're considering counseling a patient for screening, you feel a lot more comfortable when they're on the low end um, than when uh, on the high end. And so you're going to offer them uh, potentially earlier or more frequent screening based on that. In the um, same study, uh, we also looked at prostate cancer diagnosis-free survival. And so certainly we can uh, parse out the age uh, at which uh, men were ultimately diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so, if, again, if you look at a genetic assessment, those with a family history were on average, it was significantly different, but diagnosed about a year and a half before those with a negative family history. So, yes, it, having a positive family history is associated with an earlier diagnosis than those without. And similarly, rare pathogenic mutations for about the 1.5% of the population that has them uh, was associated uh, also with an earlier age of diagnosis by about a year and a half compared to those without uh, the rare pathogenic mutations. In contrast, the genetic risk score was really the one that parsed out age the best. And in fact, if you just divided it into three categories, those with a low genetic risk score, a average genetic risk score, those with a high genetic risk score, there was about a five to six year difference uh, based on the age of diagnosis. Of course, that's more dramatic if you compare the lower 1% to the high 1%, which goes up to about a 12-year uh, difference in age of diagnosis. Again, if you're going to uh, counsel patients on when they should start screening, perhaps the genetic risk score should be the factor that's most used to help guide in a quantitative fashion uh, when patients are more likely to diagnose with uh, prostate cancer. And again, because it is associated with a higher frequency of having more aggressive or lethal prostate cancer, those men should potentially get it earlier and more frequently. So if you're going to use genetic assessment uh, for a diagnosis of when, they should, when men should start screening, again, you should obtain a family history, 
But in addition, it is becoming increasingly evident that a multi-gene panel, which includes a polygenic risk score, as well as rare pathogenic mutations, including those in the HOXB13, BRCA2, ATM, and CHECK2, should uh, be strongly considered. And finally, uh, just to uh, end this uh, with a case example, uh, and this is a patient that I saw in real time. Uh, he's a 45-year-old gentleman uh, who came to me for a uh, PSA discussion. And he had no real uh, past medical history. He had his gallbladder removed. Otherwise, he appeared as a healthy individual with a normal digital exam. And his question really for me was, should he actually start screening for prostate cancer, knowing that he really has no risk factors? But as an anxious 45-year-old who was starting uh, his life in this world, he wanted to know what his, uh, the meaning uh, was for prostate cancer. And so we talked about it, and we did a genetic assessment on this uh, patient. And I should say is the controversy, uh, as many of you are aware, is that all of the authoritative uh, guidelines right now um, do not agree when we should start screening. The AUA suggests that we shouldn't start screening until age 55 unless there's a family history or you're African-American race. The NCCN suggests that we get a baseline at 45. And certainly American Cancer Society uh, is age 50, uh, but there's some variability based on um, your race or, or family history as well. So again, because there's such controversies, we really don't have a uniform guideline of when we should start this. So it's understandable that not only I don't really know, but the patient doesn't know when he should start prostate cancer screening. And so we did a genetics assessment on this individual. Again, he had no reported family history of prostate cancer. His genetic risk score was actually 2.8, so 2.8 fold higher than the average of the population, and he had no rare pathogenic mutation. So again, based on the data I showed you, is that not only is he at uh, almost threefold higher risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, but it tends to be much earlier than the average in the population. Um, and as such, uh, we offered him a PSA test. And his first PSA serum blood test was 2.4. Again, most men in their uh, 40s will have a PSA value that's under 0 0.7. So while not very high, certainly higher than most other men his age. I did follow it up with a prostate health index test, which gave me a value of a 54, which again, showing me that there's about a one in two chance of having prostate cancer in his biopsy. And based on this, he underwent a biopsy which showed Gleason 4 plus 3 uh, equals 7, 7 out of 12 cores. Based on the fact that he had uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer, higher volume, he ultimately underwent a robotic-assisted uh, radical prostatectomy. And amazingly, the final pathology um, was Gleason 8, uh, PT3A, meaning extra capsular extension, all negative margins. He's doing well today. But it was really because we did the genetic assessment that uh, led to earlier screening that we were able to identify his prostate cancer and aggressive disease at such an early age. Again, emphasizing that this patient didn't have any rare pathogenic mutations, but the signal really was derived um, from his polygenic risk score. Um, so with that, um, I thank you guys for the invitation, and I certainly thank all my collaborators, um, both here and in other institutions. Um, because it's really uh, through their help that we're able to continue to explore the utility in the clinic of genetic assessment. So thank you, guys.